Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rowan Henderson and I'm the Assistant Director of Exhibitions and Collections here at the Canberra Museum and Gallery. Uh, we, uh, Dr Auntie Matilda House had very kindly agreed to perform a welcome to country for us today. However, unfortunately she's had to uh, attend a funeral. Uh, so I'm just going to pass over to Paul Coe uh, here who... Uh, your daughter said that you would... Um, I've never done a welcome to country no? in my life and I never will do one. <laughs> oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Is there anyone else who would like to do a welcome to country? Oh, okay. Well, I would like to um, uh, acknowledge the country that we're meeting on, the land of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. Uh, I'd like to extend my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and thank them for their contribution to our community and to the work that we do here at CMAG. Um, so, uh, I'd like to introduce our two uh, speakers today. Um, Michael Anderson is an Aboriginal rights activist, leader of the Uali tribe of 3,000 people living in northwestern New South Wales and native time and title claimant to their traditional lands on their behalf. Only on Queensland side. <laughs> Only on Queensland side. He was one of the four men who drove to Canberra and set up the Aboriginal Embassy on the lawns of Parliament House in 1972. In 1979, Michael was appointed to the Office of, uh, of Public Prosecutions in Criminal Law as an instructing officer, the equivalent of a solicitor in New South Wales. He's lectured in Aboriginal Studies and Aboriginal Politics at several Australian universities and is the national convener of a new political movement in Australia that is promoting worldwide the continue, continuing sovereignty of Indigenous peoples. And Paul Coe uh, is a Wiradjuri man from Cowra, originally. He moved to Sydney in the late 1960s and became involved with Redfern community development projects such as the All Blacks football team and increasingly in activism for land rights. He's one of the initiators of the Aboriginal Legal Service which opened its doors in 1971 and was at the forefront of the Tent Embassy protests. In 1979, Paul took a case to the High Court of Australia challenging British sovereignty. His argument in that case was another step in the direction of what became known as the Mabo Judgment when rights were recognised. Paul Coe continues to bring his legal training to bear in his work advocating for Indigenous Australians. Um, so, uh, chatting with Michael um, before, he was uh, quite keen to have a fairly open um, floor for this talk and uh, he welcomes any comments or questions from the audience um, as, as we go along. Um, so, uh, just to get us started, um, although the Tent Embassy was established here in Canberra, uh, to be in the eyes of the government. Um, it was actually born on the streets of Redfern um, in Sydney. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about what Redfern was like in the late 1960s? A fun place. <laughs> it was a, indeed a fun place. Um, Redfern, Redfern at that time was uh, a place where all the young Aboriginal people were coming in from different parts of the country and um, so something was going on and, uh, in the 60s, it brought us all to Canberra, uh, brought us all to Sydney rather, and uh, congregating in Sydney, we ended up with some brilliant minds, young Aboriginal people with some very brilliant minds. And in particular, um, they came down with a fire in their belly. And, and um, it, towards the end, uh, in that mid 70s, early 70s, we began to put our heads together and, um, and it, it, you know, just uh, grew. Um, and organically, you know, it became a very powerful movement. And Paul, Paul, how, how did you come to Redfern and what was your experience living there? I came to Redfern, I didn't came to Redfern, I went to Redfern either way out of Cowra. Uh, I don't know which was the worst choice in my life, leaving Cowra or going to Redfern, because they're all basically the same, it's all bullshit. It's white control, it's about white domination, one area they do it to you openly, in the bush. Other area they hide behind the police and let the police do all the bashings to control Aboriginal people. Why they do that, I never understood. And I guess I never will until the day I die. Maybe then someone will tap in the show and say, Paul, you're bashing it up against a brick wall because those bastards don't listen to anyone. Okay? There has to be a concept of justice in this country a basic concept of justice that applies equally to each and every person born in this country. They cannot say, and they should not say, we will decide who is the favourable person, who is entitled to 
these limited rights, and if there are these limited rights, by definition, that includes every Aboriginal person born in this country. If it doesn't, we should all get the fuck out of here. Um, I'll take it up as well. One of the things that, um, when I left home and um, got down to Sydney, uh, I went home and uh, went back to see some of my aunties who were still living on the mission. And after all, 1969 is when they got rid of the commandants out of missions, you know, those white fellows that were controlling our lives. And, um, and when I went home, this was 1970, I went to see one of my great aunties on the mission and uh, she said, son, can you drive me in town? I want to get some sugar and tea and that and uh, stores because they no longer had a mission truck to take him in town. And they were, you know, six kilometres out, uh, out of town or 10 k's out of town. And so I drove her in town. And then when I got to the a monument at Walgett, she said, I went to turn left and to go down to the Chinese shop because they were the only ones who were serving black at the time. And I, I went to turn that way and she said, no, no, I've got to go down here. I can see that Mr. Sawtell. And Sawtell was the last man, Reed Sawtell was the last mission manager on Walgett uh, Mission in 1969. They pulled him out of there in 69, but made him the head welfare officer looking out for Aboriginal issues in the, in the town. And so I drove her down there and um, Auntie Madge walked in and he said, oh, hello, Auntie, yeah, how are you? And all that, and she said, I come here to Red to tell you um, that I'm only going to be in town for a while, my son here, he drove me in town to get some stores, and I'm going straight home after that. Well, I turned around and I walked out, and um, I was angry. Because here was an old woman who was conditioned in her life to appease and be responsive to a white man's command. And I was so angry, you know, I went outside and just kicked the shit out of the car, side of the car. And she came out, and I drove her down there, and, and really that that sort of instilled a bushfire inside of me and created a forest on my shoulder, not a chip. You know, and so from that moment onwards, I thought I will destroy whatever I can while ever I'm alive of the British occupation in this country. And um, from, from what I've read about uh, Redfern in that era, there, were, there was a lot going on uh, in terms of uh, the National Black Theatre uh, being established there and uh, the Aboriginal Medical Service and Aboriginal Legal Service. And Paul, I believe that that came out of um, some action that you were involved in, in uh, documenting the police harassment of Aboriginal people in Redfern. Uh, yes, and the reason why I was doing that was because my mother had two younger brothers shot and killed by police. One was the name of Pat Wedge, shot and killed in St Peter Station. 1974, 1964, uh, Milton, who was shot and killed in Unadatta. Now, I'm just talking from one family. Now, this has happened to many Aboriginal families. You grow up with the notion that you're under control by state agencies who are called police. And they know that it can kill Aboriginal people because the state's equivalent body that reprimands people for doing the wrong thing, i.e. the Supreme Courts, will never ever charge or never ever hear a case or bring a case to a point whereby they will say that that death was an act, a, a criminal act. And those police officers should be charged because if they weren't charged, why weren't they charged? Now, I know Aboriginal people are we're stupid, we're dumb, we're backward, but a bullet will find its own way and make its own mark. Now I'd ask all of you in this room, how would you feel if you see your mother, your grandmothers, having to deal with the death of their two younger brothers or their two sons? For no reason, for no crime against the white state or its agencies. Now this has happened many, many times in Aboriginal Australia. What cookbook of this country was one thing that we never had, was the rifle. If we'd had the rifle, we might have stopped that thing landing in Botany Bay. But they brought the rifle, they brought the arrogance, 
that's come and steal our country by the force of arms. No Aboriginal nation consented to the arrival of the British into their country and then to start fencing off the land, taking the resources, taking the waters and then shooting and killing Aboriginal people or poisoning the water hole to make sure Aboriginal people can no longer access the lands which were theirs for more than 50,000 years. So where does this concept of justice, which they're very keen to apply to Aboriginal people all the time, but they don't apply the same standards to themselves? So there must come a day when these people who rule this country, the members of state and commonwealth parliament, members of directors of mining companies or other companies, they must be also legally accountable the way that they've made Aboriginal people be accountable for acts. Because we don't even have the right to defend ourselves. Think about that. You walk down the street, someone comes up and whacks you over there, you defend yourself. Aboriginal person defends themselves, they go to jail. Okay, don't believe me, go and look it up for yourself. There are a number of books out there, a number of documentaries out there from white Australia documenting the institutionalised racism that, that this country is based upon. This ain't your fucking land. We never consented to it. And because I swear, put me in the big house. You have no rights to my ancestral lands. My family never consented to it. My aunties and uncles never consented to it. And most importantly, my children have never consented to it. And they never will. So where do you start to draw the line of dealing with us as being an equal to you? We're not here to fit into your shoes. We're here to tell you that we have rights as a people I'm not talking about one individual or two individuals, but an entire race of people unique to ourselves. You won't find us anywhere else in the world. So why is it one other group can turn up with the blessing of the King and Queen of England and then say, this is what you do now because we're going to enforce a law that you had no say? Because you got the gun? Because you got numerical Majority, does that give you the right to take away everything from a people who have been here for 60,000 years or longer? We used to know every inch of this land, but now the barbary fences stop that. You can't hunt, you can't fish, unless you get the consent of the trespasser. And I, I bring it back to also to the fact that what Paul is saying about coming here all the way along, if you look at all the instructions to those who came, including governors, they were not supposed to take our lands and our possessions and deprive us of our rights to move about and do our thing. And they were also supposed to consult with us. That's in all the original documents, right along, and one of the things that disturbs me is when you go back and you look at the uh, documents in England, there was, a, there was a government inquiry in 1836, 1837 in England about the treatment of the indigenous people in the dominions of the British. And one of the things was that um, one of the men who gave evidence at, at one of those, uh, at that hearing, was a man called Saxby, Sax, uh, sorry, Saxby, Sax Bannister. I'm thinking about a ginger beer, Saxby. Um, but the, but this <laughs> Sax Bannister, he made the point that the instructions, he told that inquiry that the instructions that were given to the governors were being completely ignored here in the colonies. And not only that, he, was also, he also made the point, and this is one of the conclusions that came from that inquiry, was that Aboriginal people were not even considered by the British colonisers to have a right to object to people coming onto our land, taking our land, and we had no right, according to the British settlers here, to even resist their encroachment on our lands. And so we were made out to be the trespassers. We were made out to be the, the aggressors. 
And so, and it's even reported in those reports that, you know, if we dared to resist the white occupation, they shot us and drove us back into the bush and shot us like kangaroos and dogs. You know, and, and the, the policies in this country, and this is why, you know, Tony Abbott and, you know, your modern day politicians don't want history taught in, uh, in the schools in this country, is because of the horrific problems that the people in this country will be subjected to when they start looking at what they actually did to Aboriginal people in this country. And, um, and the, the horrors, the type of things like skinning women alive and tying them between trees to make men come out of the bush to give themselves up from resisting. Um, you know, burying babies and driving horses across the top of them and um, knocking their heads off with butts of rifles. This is all documented by the men who actually did it. You know, and, and so you go back to my own town. In Walgett in 1943, you know, they tied one of the black fellas up who bashed the shit out of one of the coppers there um, for what he was doing, come chasing black fellas over the river. He caught the policeman on his arm down the river and he bashed him. And then they caught that man, tied him up at a tree and made all the Aboriginal people watch him die from starvation and water. No one was allowed near him. And that tree is still standing there. We, we watch that tree very closely. Anybody go near that tree, you start a fight there. Um, so, you know, the, the horrors that took place in this country, the horrors that are still taking place now, um, is beyond belief. And, you know, you guys are, are pretty comfortable here because you live on this side of the mountains and you live on top of the mountains or you live on the east coast. But when you get inland and you start seeing what's going on out there, right, never believe what the media is telling you about all this closing the gap and all the goodness that's going on. Our people are being screwed left, right and centre out there. The mining companies are ripping our land apart you know, and we get 0.05% royalties. And no Aboriginal person is allowed to control that money. It's got to go to a public trust like the Myers Foundation, and they operate all the trust accounts, and then they deliver a little bucket of money out to the people uh, during the year. The, the horrors of, of being an Aboriginal person out in that bush out there, it's, it's quite frightening. And we're not allowed to get angry. Yeah? We're not allowed to get angry, as Paul said. We get angry, they shoot us. Or they throw you in jail. You know, you're, you're, and so it goes back to an 1836 report that Aboriginal people are still not allowed to resist. We're not allowed to say no to a white man. And, and this is one of the horrors of the, of the suppression of us as having civil rights in this country. So all those things that you hear about in terms of equal rights, equal suffrage, they don't apply to Aboriginal people. They apply to everyone else, but not us. And, um, I just wish that, you know, back then we had people who were not kind. Yeah. We were humble people. And our old people, through because they were of humility, they only resisted when the men came out after our women. And that's what started all those fights. Read all the documentation. It's when the men went after the Aboriginal women because there were no women here. Yeah. Like for God's sake, read them read the journals of, of the governors. In Sydney, you know, they were sent into England in, 18, in the 1870s, 1880s, for pots and pans because they couldn't cook. Yeah, but they sent a shipload of women out, and everybody cursed them. Yeah, so this is a colony here. This is one of the worst colonies you'll ever find in terms of historical stuff. When you look at the a policy that they had um, way back when, was their, their policy in this country was based on what was given to Governor Phillips when he came. In the secret orders, he was to apply the rules and disciplines of war. What a lot of people do not tell you is how many big ships, gunships, that they sent with Phillips. They talk about all those other seven little boats that came with him, but colonists in them. But they don't talk about the big gunships that they sent. Because, you see, Cook already told them that there were Aboriginal people living right along that coastline. There. And so they were unaware of how many people were here, they were unaware of the type of resistance we would have, and based on their experiences in, um, uh, in Nigeria, they sent the gunboats up the rivers, so they would have sent the gunboats up into the Sydney Harbour and blasted the shit out of all those black fellas living along the coast there with those big gunships. And so they were ready for a war. And so the, the, the laws that came into existence was the rules and disciplines of war. Now, nowhere in historical records, government or otherwise, will you ever find where that law 
that order has ever been taken away from applying to Australia. So the rules and disciplines of war still apply to Aboriginal people, our interaction between us. That's why the police can do what they do. And by the way, the police are not a civil, civil um, police organisation in this country. They're a corporate body of people. And if you go and look at the Australian, uh, Australian Constitution, those police are ex officio military co people. That's why they have so much power in this country. And we haven't yet gone and attacked that yet because we're too busy fighting for our land and getting some control of our own identity and our lives. Um, but the police in this country are not civil police. And read the Australian Constitution and you also read um, all that laws that apply to the rules and disciplines of war. They are a military force and they are there to protect property, property of the occupiers, people, not protect any rights that we may have. Now, I would ask you as all to, to give consideration to one thing, actually two things. You've got a house just up the road here called the Parliament of Australia. Which Aboriginal person gave consent for that Parliament House to be established on these lands? Today, which Aboriginal person gives consent? I know you've got three or four in the house, but the house has already been built and it's been there for a long time. Did the Ngunnawal people from here consent to them erecting this monstrosity on their land? Same thing occurred at, at the state levels. And because these houses were erected, Aboriginal people have to live with the consequences of having power taken away from them so that these people then decide you will live by our rules, under our law. If you don't like it, you know, slit your throat. Okay, I'll say this to you. It's the last thing I'll say to you. These things that have happened in the past, unfortunately, they're still carrying on today. They mightn't be killing us in the way that they did 150 years ago. But the consequences of those killings are still here with us today because they're not doing anything to change the effect. Everyone in this room is enjoying the benefit of Aboriginal mass murder. You didn't do it, but you enjoy the long-term benefit of Aboriginal people not living and controlling their own lands under Aboriginal law. And that includes that fucking building Across the, across the river there. We never consented to that place being established here. Never consented their armies being on our lands, their police forces being on our lands, their judicial systems acting upon our land to determine whether Aboriginal people are good or bad people, or whether we've broken their laws. How are we bound by their laws? Mm -hmm. We were here 60,000 years or more before they arrived. And then they say, when they arrive, we are then going to introduce a system of laws that makes you legally accountable for these new things that they brought in. And if you do the wrong thing, you'll go to jail. Or years gone past, you'll get killed. Not one Aboriginal person has ever consented to this process. This is still our land, this is still our country. Things have not changed. I know you didn't do the things that maybe your ancestors have done, but the unfortunate fact of the matter is you're doing nothing to change the consequences because you still enjoy the benefits of those horrific acts. Tell me of one Aboriginal nation in here that's recognised the legitimacy of the British Crown or its inheritor the Commonwealth of Australia on our lands, waters and country. It's a matter for you to make that decision, not for me. Thank you. And if I can conclude just by simply saying that um, we have a thing um, in this country called the Native Title Act. Yeah. And um, Paul is talking about the, you know, that, that continuous um, operations of British 
now Australia, um, like everybody says we're a self-governing nation, we're a colony. You read the Constitution of Australia. The Constitution of Australia is a federation of colonial states. That, it actually says that in the Constitution of Australia. The Constitution of Australia is still a, you know, a, a British institution, so Australia doesn't have their own constitution. You know, that constitution is an act of the British Parliament. Here in this country, the, the governments, both state and federal, they govern in right of the English Crown. Yeah? And so when you look at the Crown, the Queen is only the head of that. You know, you've got uh, this corporation. The Crown is a corporation. Yeah? And so the, this corporation actually owns this country with that Queen at its head. Now, when you look at Australian constitutions, the state and the federal con uh, constitution, no law that you elect parliaments, you elect parliaments every four years, every three years, right? When you elect those parliaments, they make laws supposedly for the citizens of this country and good governance of this country. But you see, even though you elect them, none of those laws become legal until the Queen's representative signs them. Yeah? So you're electing a government over here, pretending that you're there governing for you, but they're not, they're governing for the, that old woman over there living in Buckingham Palace, yeah? Someone else owns this bloody place, not you, yeah? You just have a piece of paper that gives you, like an Aboriginal person these days under the Native Title Act, you have a title deed to your land, you know? that, that piece of paper is not worth the paper it's written on, quite frankly, yeah? But they hide it because they got the, like Paul says, they got the power of the gun. And they got courts, they appoint the courts over here and every government always appoints someone who's going to look after their interests, of course they are, talk about vested interests, you know, they don't talk about the judges that they appoint to, to courts, Supreme Courts, local courts and even the High Court, you know, the Federal Court. All of these people are politically appointed to support the ideals and maintain the status quo within this country. And of course the status quo in this country are based on people who are murderers and thieves, yeah? And so we as Aboriginal people, we're applying and we're, we're, we're fighting with people trying to seek justice from a group of thieves who told the land from us in the first place. Yeah? And, so, and they make laws to protect that uh, to this day. And if you read the Native Title Act, John Howard was very clever in 1998. Like, he, he's an evil little weevil, that man. Yeah? He's, he's just horrible. But he was clever to work out that the, there was a, the Keating and his mob they made a terrible mistake in the Native Title Act. One thing that they didn't do was to secure certainty of land tenure in this country for the occupiers. And so what he did was that he amended the Native Title Act in 1998 and he made sure that in that Native Title Act that Aboriginal people had to sign an Indigenous Land Use Agreement. And in many cases Aboriginal people today are being asked to sign an Indigenous Land Use Agreement before they get a Native Title determination. Yeah? And I say that because in that act, John Howard introduced three basic fundamental legal principles to supposedly legalise the theft of this land. One, he asked in those issues, they're all there, you, you approve of past acts. Yeah? So you validate past acts. You validate um, what do they call it? Immediate acts. The, um, the pre what do you call it? Intermediate. Intermediate acts. And they also ask you to sign that in your for future acts. Yeah. And so when you're sitting down and you because these things are only contracts. That's all they are. Yeah. And so those contracts are illegal because you can't ask someone to sign a document when they've got no idea what a, what a past act means when they don't know what an intermediate act means, and they don't know what a future act means. And so, let me just tell you what they're doing in Western Australia and other places. Uh, they, I've gone through a lot of papers in Western Australia now, working with the people, in, particularly in, in the Pilbara and the Amersley Iron Ore area. And what they've done is that they've got Aboriginal people there to sign these Indigenous land use agreements from 1998 onwards prior to a native title determination being made. Yeah? And so, and they say this, you know, this agreement is subject to a determination being made. Now you can't do that in law, you know, you lawyers in this room will know that, that contract does not stand. But 
What they don't tell Aboriginal people when they say, Yo, we want you to validate past acts, they're asking the Aboriginal people to validate all those land grants right back to 1788. That's what they're doing, right? And, and when you read the High Court in Mabo, Mabo said a valid act extinguishes an Aboriginal claim. And so John Howard cleverly disguised this thing called a past act and he's not going to tell any white lawyer, so you don't get a job if you're going to tell Aboriginal people in the Native Title Service organisation. If you're going to tell them that that's a past act and a past act means you're going to validate all those land grants, well then you don't get the job. Yeah? You get sacked straight away as a lawyer. So the lawyers are breaching their code of ethics as well. They're not, they're not telling the people this. They're not telling them about an immediate act. And an immediate act is from 75 to now. Yeah? And that's all the land grants, all the... Um, stock routes and crown lands that were vacant way back uh, up to 75. So they've given these to the farmers who live next door to these crown lands. All these blokes have got their title over it. They, got, they give them a lease over this land. And so that suppresses an Aboriginal native title claim over that land that was once there available up, up to 1975, even after. So they've made sure that they don't get any access to that crown land. The second thing, the third one was uh, a future act. So they're asking Aboriginal people to sign these future acts and forego all of their future claims. So when a mining company comes in on your land, so there's your land, the determination has now been made, but you've signed this agreement before the determination was made. So all of a sudden they find gold over there, uranium over here, and other diamonds over here. Now they come in and say, well, you can't negotiate over them there. We don't have to give any royalty because you signed a future act which said that you forego all those claims. Yeah? That's what they've done to Aboriginal people. And, and in, in all of that, the people lose, lose out over all their country. They, they give it away, but they don't even know that they're giving it away. And then there's another part in those, in those agreements, courtesy John Howard, is that once you sign those things, you surrender everything. You surrender all future claims. That includes compensation for wrongdoings against your people. Yeah? And so this is what they've done. This is how devious these people are. Yeah? And, so, and these are the people you elect to Parliament. Yeah? They don't talk to you about it. They don't tell you what they're doing to Aboriginal people. You know, because Aboriginal people are not of your concern. They're the government. You elect them, and they make the decisions. Yeah? You have one horrible group of people in this country who's got a set agenda to maintain you people and your children completely ignorant of what's going on in this country. They're dumbing you down. Okay? They're dumbing your university students down. Okay? Your lawyers won't even ask questions. And so you, we've got a problem in this country here. It's one of making sure that they keep you dumb. They make sure that you don't answer, ask any questions. Yeah, and that's what you, that's the sort of country you're living in. And they're getting away with it. They're getting away with it. So would we like to open the floor now for any questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, it's a little bit off the cuff, <coughs> but I um, do agree with uh, Michael there. Um, it's very interesting, the sex banister, um, British um, House of Commons um, committee. I do recommend people uh, follow up on that just by going to Google and Googling Sachs Bannister. Um, Sachs is uh, four letters, S-A-X-E, and that's uh, quite illuminating um, reading. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll challenge uh, Paul a little bit because he was uh, referring to uh, mass uh, murder. I think it's a little bit more serious than that. And I think it's a case of um, genocide. And, uh, and, and if people aren't happy with that, maybe a concept of frontier genocide or colonial genocide to separate it from what happened in the uh, Second World War. The other point I'd like to make is that um, when the British landed, they were practically defeated because they were uh, using the old brown bess muskets against um, spears, and spears can easily, at night time in particular, um, overwhelm brown best muskets. Um, the only reason that the uh, Aboriginal nations were defeated at that stage was because they spread smallpox. They did it three times. Sydney Cove, 
around Bathurst and up at the Kimberleys. So that's the, the real history we need to recognise. Also, with the embassy, we should also, I want to put on record, that it was um, facilitated by Noel Hazard, who was a photographer with the Tribune, and, uh, and, and in Canberra, uh, a lot of the um, equipment was also provided by the local branch of the Communist Party. Uh, so I think that should not be ignored as well. Indeed. Indeed. Many of the folders. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would, yes, I would, I would like to emphasise those points. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? Um, yeah, this is for both of you. Um, we hear people talking about the... That's the field photographer's um, phone. <laughs> um, we hear people talking about the continental common law in this country. Can you explain how that differs from what the British and the Australians call the common law? Um, that, that's a good question. I, I fought two Supreme Court cases now against paying rates at Shires. Yeah one in Queensland, one in New South Wales. In New South Wales, they, um, they still haven't worked it out what to do. Uh, it's been, that's five years now. Um, but in Queensland, uh, Justice Philippides, she, she um, in the Supreme Court, she took it and, um, and I, I talked about you know, the fact that Aboriginal people have a continental common law and it's based on our song lines, our religion, our spirituality. We connect right across this country and that creation stories is what is the foundation of our law, but you have to abide by that. Yeah, you you don't abide by that. We've got capital punishment in our law. You do the wrong thing, you're in a lot of trouble. We don't have policemen. We don't have prisons. Yeah, but we kept order. And so, when we when I describe this as this com continental common law existing, and that no other state can take away that continental common law from the existing people who are the ones who govern and rule over that that law. Um, and so she, uh, in her decision, um, incorrectly said, well, you know, the continental common law from Europe was never transferred to Australia, was never brought to Australia. And I thought, when I read the judgment, I thought, hang on a minute, is this woman, is she right or what? You know, she's a justice of the Supreme Court, for heaven's sake. And she's talking about the transportation and the imposition of the, of the European continental common law. Um, when I was talking about our continental common law here because it is a continental common law and it's common to all of us through our ceremonies and through our, right across this country. So those lead, head men know those song lines. They know the women, they all know where this crisscrosses right across this country. That establishes the law in this country and we govern that. We govern that. And Mabo even acknowledged that uh, the, con the Aboriginal law and custom yeah, is, a, is not a construct of the British law but it, it's Aboriginal law and custom. It comes from this land, comes from our people, comes from our dream, and it's inalienable by the common law. Yeah? So no parliament in this country can pass any laws against us to suppress any of our rights under our law and custom. Yeah? And so this is why, and it's interesting you say this because I wanted to make this comment earlier. You see, I, I know some um, American businessmen who are now, um, refusing throughout the United States to invest in Australia. Because you see, they got a problem. When they arrive at the international airport, they walk out of the airport and they see three flags. They see the Australian flag, they see the Aboriginal flag, and they see the Torres Strait Island flag. When you look at those three, the question you ask is, okay, that's the Australian flag, so the law of the country is the Australian one, but wait a minute, what's these other two? Yeah? So you've got the Aboriginal flag there, and you've got the Torres Strait Island flag there. And so they also represent laws of their own that applies to this land. So the question then is, who makes the decision in relation to the law of the land in this country? Right now we have three laws operating in this country. One for the Torres Straits, one which is our continental common law right across this country under our law and custom, and that's why that flag flies. When that flag flies, that means that sovereignty of the nation 
is also Aboriginal sovereignty. So there's shared sovereignty here. And so the question is, whose law do you apply in this country? And that's one of the big questions that a lot of people are starting to ask now, particularly in the international arena, not in Australia, because nobody knows about it. I was just wondering, um, in today's age of social media and um, the whole digital realm, what you feel is the ongoing um, significance of the physical presence of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy outside Old Parliament House, and how you feel its continuing relevance um, is sort of resonating amongst um, the general Australian population? Oh, I can hear again. <laughs> That over there, in its silence, is deafening. It really kills the Australian claim to sovereignty over this country. It really creates problems for, the, for those who sit up on the big house up the top. It may be down there in front of the little house, but the big house up the top there cannot move that. They know that there is a problem. And unfortunately for them, it represents another sovereign existence yeah, on this country. One of the mistakes we made, I think, but I now twist it around, because we learned how to think really clever like white collars and be devious. Um, so the embassy sits on the Uradri land, yeah? Ngunnawal land. It sits on their country. And so we are a foreign group of people who don't belong to this land. We can't make decisions for the Uradri and the Ngunnawal people. And so that embassy is a representation of the respect to those people. Not a respect to the Australians because I'm not a party to them and I don't want to be a party to them. And uh, But when we put it up there, there was also another little little um, manila folder that said sovereignty never ceded. And the only man who took that up was a social scientist by the name of um, C.D. Rowley, who wrote about the destruction of the Aboriginal society. And C.D. Rowley spoke about the genius of that word, sovereignty never ceded those words, because he said that denotes that there is another sovereign state existing in this country. And, um, and he, he was the only one that made that point at the time when the embassy was put up. I, I would take a somewhat different approach. <coughs> and uh, the question I would answer in this way, <coughs> uh, as a member of the Rajmu Nation, which is on the border, and I've got none more blood in me, means that I can answer the question from both those two nations, is that no matter we say, what well, no matter what we say or what we do, we're not gonna have a say on the douse over there. And I can say all the nice words on the sun, it's not gonna change the door opening to give us what we're entitled to. I'm not asking you to consider us as saying, gee, you're, you're hungry, you're grabbing everything you can see. Well, no, we're not, because it's always been ours. So you can't compensate us for what is ours. What you've got to do is make sure we have what is ours back to us. You can keep all your cash, keep all your money, keep all your diamonds and jewels. Just let us have our country back. Then we will build up our own infrastructure the way our language, the way our law, and the way our culture will expect us to do it. I don't know if I've answered your question, because it, the question is extremely difficult to answer because I can't read the future. And the relevance of it is that we still have a problem. Hello, Kaya. Um, my name is Aileen Noah and I'm from Western Australia. I'm Lunga Nalia from Des as well. Um, and I'd like to say how um, very um, grateful I am to have been able to be here today to um, hear and see two of my heroes, you know, because I've known about the work that you've done, even from work. Yeah, don't look behind. I'm talking about you too. And um, so thank you. But I'd also like to say that um, I take umbrage at that man, I don't know who it was, who um, corrected all the historical details that Paul Cohn, you know, he thought got wrong. But um, it really is a case of when it comes to us understanding our experience of invasion, 
we don't need it to be white explained to us in detail about you know how people were killed. It is simply a fact that Aboriginal people all over the country were massacred, and yet you can um, say, well, some died by disease, and some died by guns, and some died by poisoning. But the simple matter, or the simple fact of the matter is, is that Aboriginal people were just killed and murdered. So, enough of white explaining, please. Um, I, was, I also want to thank both of you for like all your patience and your generosity of sharing all this stuff. That I think, you know, this is this is the same narrative that gets consumed by the white audience all the time. Um, but I know from um, study that Red Fern was the center of like the Black Power movement, and within that there were all these like anti-colonial co connectivities um, with African-American shipbuilders, you, I don't know, like sharing literature. And I think, Michael, you also mentioned that, um, I suppose, there were Chinese shopkeepers who served black fellows. Um, and I know that with, I think, like the Asian Aboriginal relations, they weren't always good, or like they weren't always about solidarity. But I think it's also um, something that's really present these days, or well, at least something to think about because of how Chinese um, mining companies are also part of the extraction of Aboriginal land. Um, but while that's happening, I think there's a younger generation, I think both of like um, black fellows, but also um, uh, migrant, migrant settlers who are sort of building these anti-colonial infrastructures, um, especially in Warang, I think. Um, yeah, so I was wondering if maybe you could talk more on like the sort of historical relations with like Aboriginal and Asian people, if there were, if you recall any. My nan used to talk about <clears throat> an Aboriginal mission that um, all of the Uwaliai were routed up on at a place called Angleton near the Queensland New South Wales border. And uh, there were three old Chinamen turned up there uh, during these early days and they started a market garden. And they served the Aboriginal people with the vegetables. Yeah? And so they had a very good relationship with Aboriginal people. Um, I can also say that there is a very big Aboriginal Asian population in Australia. The Chinese men were lonely. Yeah? And um, I've spoken with some people about this in Sydney with the Chinese uh, Chamber of Commerce about uh, the interface between Aboriginal and Chinese during those, particularly the gold period. Um, but our relationship with um, China goes back to the Ming Dynasty when uh, I, we've only just recently, I've, in the last uh, two years, found this book called um, 1421 where the Chinese came down and mapped all of Australia um, during this period. And they also had a relationship with Aboriginal people, trading with people called fresh water and so on. Um, and it's young, cucumbers, right? Yeah, yeah. Up, and up in, up in Queensland on the yeah. north coast there. So there's been a trade relationship going on with, um, with Chinese Ming Dynasty people um, well in advance of when the British came here. So, and that recognition is a, is, is a very strong claim to uh, sovereign recognition by a foreign state, being, that being China, of course. Um, and right through those gold fields, if I can talk about the relationship with, uh, that I know of, um, uh, like my ex-partner, her grandfather was a Chinese, um, what do you call a market gardener, up in Croydon in Queensland. And so she has Chinese blood in her through that man, um, as now my children. Um, and so we have a, a situation where a lot of Chinese um, got involved with Aboriginal people. Japanese in the room got involved with a lot of Aboriginal people as well. So there's a, a very strong relationship. Uh, the people from the Malacus, uh, uh, the Malacus Islands, um, they have very, they, they traded in marriages, they married, they traded with the Aboriginal people of Arnhem Land uh, for quite some time. So 
we've had these foreign relationships uh, for a long, long time. Um, I, I guess, you know, the, the, my, like I, I love some of the history of Chinese because I had one old man, I was fortunate to meet an old fellow at one of those Chinese chamber, one of the Chamber of Commerce meetings in Sydney. He said, well, he said, um, he said, we did them over anyway. They didn't let us mine the gold because they banned us from mining the gold. But they were lazy, these British, yeah? right? They didn't know how to iron their clothes. They didn't know how to wash their clothes. They didn't know how to make a feed for themselves. They were too busy mining gold and they had nothing to eat, so we grew the vegetables after they told us we were not allowed to mine the gold. He said, so we let them slave all day, dig out all the gold, then they cash it all and then they bring it over here to us and we use it. Yeah. And so we ended up with more money out of the gold than they did. Yeah. And so, so that's how stupid they are. Yeah. And, and so Australians are like that. Yeah. Look at them now, they, they haven't got a bloody clue of what's going on in this country. Yeah. And the country is being taken away from underneath them. We're the only ones out there on the coal face fighting it off. We're the ones resisting. We're still resisting. And so, you know, the Australians down here, all they talk about is whether they got a big bill to pay, whether you four buggers are gonna be taxed more and pay, pay the bill for, you know? We're at the coal face, we're down there fighting, we're still fighting for our land and we'll never stop. Yeah? The only people who are standing in the way are the people you elect. Thank you. So. Uh, one more, one more question. Oh. Yeah, g'day. Um, I was wondering um, if there are us do good or white fellas out here who'd like to lend a hand to what you guys are up to, what are some of the common mistakes that do good or white fellas make uh, in coming to lend a hand and just get in the way? And what are some of the things that we uh, that you would point us towards uh, that are the good things we can be helping out with? I'll answer that question. <laughs> I got one comment too. <laughs> uh, my experience with dealing with white collars on our level is that as soon as they get a bit of power, they change. Mm. They are not the same person who mix with us in the pub. They're not the same person who work with us in the organisation. They're now way above us. You look at every judge in New South Wales who's worked with an Aboriginal Legal Service. Every one of those assholes has sold Aboriginal people out. Their generosity, their compassion walks out the door as soon as they get the bench top post on their head. So fuck them. And my, my comment as well is that it's very difficult to um, for non-Aboriginal people to really get into the mindset of us, thinking about you know our experiences, like we have a life's experiences, and then we we learn that we learn that around the table when we were kids, listening to our old people sort of being very fearful of for future generations because how do we stop this onslaught of white dominance and how do we how do we prevent our kids from you know becoming them yeah. And uh, there's a famous fellow called Pierre Clastre who did a lot of study, an anthropologist, he did it in, in Bolivia and, and uh, in South America. And he was looking at you know, Spanish experience and Portuguese, Portuguese experience. And it was always about them. And it was always about making them, making the other them. Yeah? And so they set up a strategy to make them think like that. And so one of the things was, and I, I look at this thing and I'm really confused about it because, you know, people like Paul and us, we grew up watching our people be heard and watching it and we listened to those people. We were there. Our kids are not hearing that anymore. They, sure, they hear it on the streets and they hear us marching and all that and there's a lot of them talking about, a lot of those kids are angry because they know that they've got cousins who are dying in custody, they've got mothers, sisters, everybody um, suffering. Yeah? And sure, they're angry. But to articulate that into a strategy to fight for, you know, um, identity, fight for your own rights, and stand up and get back what it is, when you're so far removed from your language and your actual culture of being practiced, unfortunately, we're in a, they, a lot of them are in the mindset of the white occupiers, and they're thinking like that. 
And so, you know, I go back and I talk to a lot of my mob and I say, well, we've got to start this, A, B, C and D. And they say, oh, well, we, we should put in, a, put in a, for an application and get some money off the government for that. And I say, no, 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 we're fighting those bastards. Yeah? Why do you want to ask them for money? Because they're going to come along with a little piece of, a little fine print down the bottom to say that they own everything that they, they buy for you or they give to you. And they can come along and close it down anytime they want to. And so our problem now is getting our kids back to thinking like us and this language that they're doing, you know. Like I'm, I'm blue with a lot of my young ones out home. I do speak Yuali. Yeah? And one of the things that I, I have problems with is that they're learning from a book. Yeah? And there's a lot of tapes that the old people made with the language, but these young ones sitting down listening now, I think they Mongovina too, you know, like blind ears we say that's my language, yeah? Because they can't get the phonetics properly. And so if they're not getting the phonetics properly, you change the language a little bit. Yeah? And and I was brought up by grandmothers who used to hunt me out of the room and tell me to go and play marbles or football if I said a word wrong. You're not listening to me, mate, you're not interested. Go away, go on. You know, so You've got to, this language that we're learning now is really a bastard language um, that's going on out there, and so I'm fighting. And the bloke who wrote our stuff out there, have been writing it, is a bloody former Catholic priest, for God's sake. Yeah, I, I shouldn't take his name in vain, but anyway. Um, he's, someone's lying for me. Yeah, no, someone is. <laughs> um, but he's, he's written this book, and unfortunately I'm saying to him, you know, there's this massive dictionary called the Gamora Yualia language, but the thing is, I keep saying, there's five languages mixed up in there, and they've got all these words in there representing these two languages, but it's not, it's not the case. There's five different language word groups represented in that book. And, so, and none of them, you know, other than the speakers of the language, can identify which words they are. But they're now promoting that. And so what they're doing is that they're creating a language from that book and taking it back and, ser and serving that up to the children in the schools, and I'm I'm so bitter about that, and um, so you know it's it, so there, there is a real problem. So if they if they're doing that to us, you know they they're giving back a language program that's bastardised. You know those old white men who went out there, they were in their sixties and seventies and fifties. You know half of them were bloody deaf anyway. You know they couldn't hear properly. You know, and so they were writing down words based on what they heard. And now people are getting them out of, the, out of the libraries, bringing it back and then presenting them as the language. Not true. Sure, we've got to start somewhere. Yes, I agree with that. But at least listen to some people who've got some knowledge about it. Yeah, and, and, and we need to make sure that we get it right. Otherwise, we're just corrupting everything for our children and grandchildren. Oh, before we go, can I ask a question of all you fellows? Ten years from the day, who will be standing up for Aboriginal people's rights in this room? I'm still alive, aren't I? You won't believe that long. <laughs> I mean, I'm asking you seriously. I don't know. Yes, I expect you to be Thank you for your honesty. Um, oh, so I would like to thank Michael and Paul very sincerely for spending their time to come and talk with us today and to share their experiences and their knowledge and to help us understand um, a little bit more um, about the past and the current state of Australia. So thank you very much. I'd like to talk about the future. <laughs> We'd like to talk about the future, but we don't know what that holds. <laughs> Fair enough. And thank you very much to everyone who's come along today to um, listen to Paul and Michael. Um, and hope to see you again sometime at CMAG. Thank you. Thank you.